I think I'm having technical difficulties with this mic today. I like it green. I'll talk long. How's that? You guys ready? Is it not on? It's not working. I'll fix it. All right. So, happy Father's Day, everybody. And uh, if it wasn't for Dad, we wouldn't be here today. One Dad. His name's the Lord. Amen. Amen. What a privilege of of uh, having children and having a family. And uh, one thing about family is that uh, there's an anniversary. You know, the man, beats, man meets girl and they get married and they have anniversary. 70 years, Tuesday, Dave and uh, Shirley Eldred. It was 20 years ago that we had a, a wedding here, a, a, a recommitment, I guess you could say, of their vows. What a blessing and what a privilege that was, Dave, and surely that was 20 years ago. And uh, here we are, 70th. So when you hit 100, we'll do another one of those. <laughs> okay? A couple of prayer requests this morning. Greg Norris had his open heart surgery last Tuesday. Greg has one kidney is, that was donated from, by his brother Doug. And uh, so the surgery went well, but the kidney, the one kidney is already starting to uh, falter, is not doing good. Uh, it looks like he'll probably have to have full-time or a regular dialysis uh, by the way things are looking at this moment. Uh, continue to pray for Greg. Keep him in your prayers. I know he uh, really appreciates all the prayers. And if you think about sending him a card, I'm sure he would appreciate hearing from you. Just letting him know that uh, he has loved and prayed for it. B. Cole is going to be going to the uh, Cleveland Clinic. You know, B's been suffering for some time now. She's had breathing issues and difficulty. And uh, so now they've got an appointment at Cleveland Clinic. So Mike will be taking her down there this week to pray. To pray. Uh, let's pray <laughs> that they can figure it out and uh, that she'll get the help that she needs. Pray for my grandson Noah. A couple of weeks ago was our grandson Judah. And uh, he'll be here tomorrow uh, coming up from Tennessee for a couple of weeks. Uh, before 4th of July. We're looking forward to see, seeing him. Judah's doing great, by the way. His hearing is excellent. Everything's doing well for him. And then our grandson, Noah, Sarah's boy, fell. And uh, last Sunday, we reported that he had broke his femur and kneecap. Well, when they got to Grand Rapids to the DeVos Hospital, apparently it was not the femur, just the kneecap. Had surgery. Six, six weeks? Six weeks. Now he has to keep his leg absolutely straight. Cannot bend it for six weeks. For an 11-year-old, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, so pray for, pray for little Noah. I'm sure he would appreciate that very much. Uh, prayer for him that that kneecap would heal up well. This morning as we celebrate Father's Day, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 22. When I think of Genesis chapter 2, I think of one of the greatest love stories ever told. I'll try not to get emotional. But it's the love story of a father. A story of love that a man has for his son. And actually, we have to elevate our eyes a little higher because truly this is the story of God and God's love for us. Father, this morning as we just bow our heads together, we remember Greg Norris. Lord, do you know Greg, he knows you. He's not hidden from your sight. You know the suffering that he's been going through and thank you that the surgery was successful. Now we pray as, uh, as it looks, the kidney may not survive, but Lord, this is in your hands. Life and death belong to you, whether it's life itself or a kidney. You're in control and I know, Father, we know from your word that you have a perfect plan, a perfect purpose in all of these things. Strengthen Greg's uh, faith, encourage his heart, Lord. We pray that um, if this is what he needs, if he needs this dialysis, that you just work out all the details. Thank you for Greg's positive attitude in these things, and we just pray for his wife, his kids. Bless them, Lord. Thank you for them. We pray for Noah, that his kneecap would heal up well. For B, as she goes to the Cleveland Clinic this week, give Mike and her safety as they travel down, and give the doctors wisdom, Lord, and we pray that uh, you would just bring healing about for her. Thank you for this morning, for all of the fathers that are here today. Thank you for the visitors. 
our guests, our friends who are here. Bless, bless our time together, we ask, and may you be honored, glorified in all of these things. In Christ's name, amen. Father's Day is an important day because the idea of being a father is the representation or should be the representation of who God is in our life. Not everybody is fortunate to have a father. Not everyone is fortunate enough to have a father who loves and cares and, and is concerned for their child. I'm reminded what the Word of God tells us when our mother and father forsake us. God the Father says, and I take you in. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. Almighty God reaches out towards humanity and says, let me be your father. He is our creator. God created the heavens and the earth. God created man in his own image. In the likeness of God created he them, male and female. We understand that. We know that God took with his hands and he reached down into the dust of the ground and he pulled up the clay and he fashioned the body, a man, and he breathed into him the spirit of God and he became a living soul. But we have to be careful that we don't confuse the idea of this universal fatherhood of God with a relationship with God the Father. God is the Father of all creation. God is the Father of life. That's true. But Adam forfeited that position that he had before God when he disobeyed. When he ate of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, sin entered into the world, and that relationship was severed. God says now that to those who believe in him, John chapter 1, verse 12, and to all that received him, Christ, God gave those people the power, the right, the authority, the privilege to be called the sons of God. If you're not born again, if you're not saved, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can't say that I am a child of God. Oh, you can honestly say you're God's creation, yes. But mankind as a whole cannot say that God is our Father. God is my Father. That is a privilege that comes, that's a relationship that comes through faith alone in Jesus Christ. For it was Jesus who healed the broken relationship between Adam and God the Father. It was through that sacrifice of Jesus Christ, He coming to this earth, He giving His life, He paying that sin debt that we all incurred through Adam. For in Adam all die. In Adam, we're all sinners. In Adam, we are all set outside of the family of God, but it's through faith in Jesus Christ. He brings us back into his family. It says we have received that adoption through Christ. We are his children. God says, I call you my son. We call him Abba, Abba Father, which literally in the original language, Abba simply means daddy. And if that ain't your daddy calling Justin, <laughs> no, <I'm> just <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Sorry, Justin. It's, okay. it's happened to me before. That was really embarrassing. Usually I don't uh, try to get rid of that thing. But. but listen, this relationship that God has offered to mankind, I will be your father and you will be my son is based upon God's love. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 18, we have an amazing account. Abraham, the father of faith. Abraham, who was justified by his faith. Abraham, who believed God, Scripture tells us, and God imputed to him righteousness, not the righteousness of his self-righteousness. Uh, righteousness, not of Abraham's works, but a righteousness that was God, that God gave to him because Abraham believed God. And uh, so what was it that Abraham believed God about? This morning, uh, you can write these verses down, jot them down, but you remember Abraham? Uh, God called Abraham out of the land of Ur, out of the land of the Chaldean. And God had promised in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, God had promised to Abraham that out of his seed, God would bless all the families of the earth. Abram, Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation, God said. And your seed will be as the stars of the heavens. He took him out. 
And he said, look at the stars. You can't count them, and so shall your seed be. And out of your seed, all the families of the world will be blessed. The reference of that seed, of course, is the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one God would send to redeem us, bring us back into a relationship with Jehovah, Almighty God. It was that seed that God had mentioned in the Garden of Eden to Satan, Lucifer, the serpent, that old devil, after he had deceived Eve and Adam and Eve disobeyed God. I'll put enmity between your seed and her seed. You shall bruise his, bruise his heel, but he shall crush thy head. That seed of the woman, speaking of that promised Messiah who would come one day, Later on in the book of Genesis, it goes on and the Lord appears to Abraham and I'm going to bless you, Abraham, and I'm going to fill the earth with your seed and all of these things. And Abraham said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, I got a little problem here. So I'm like 90 years old and I ain't got a kid. How's it going to happen? And Abraham asked God, how are you going to, how is this going to happen? How are you going to fulfill this promise? Seems I have no son of my own. My servant in my house is the only thing that I have near an inheritance. And God said, it's not going to be him. It's going to be your own child. It's going to be from you and Sarah. And it says Abraham fell on his face and laughed. Can you imagine? God said, I'm going to give you a child, you and Sarah, and you're going to, and you're going to have this promised seed. Uh-huh, sure. And he laughs. God said, for that, you can call him Isaac. Well, Abraham wasn't the only one who laughed because some years later, God shows up again and he tells him the same promise. And he said, in a year from now, Sarah's going to have a kid. Sarah's in the tent making dinner. She hears the angel of the Lord. She starts laughing too. Well, I guess if I was 100 years old and God said, I was going to have a kid, I'd, I think I'd probably cry, actually. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'd laugh or not. I'd, I'd probably cry. If Lenny was 90 and the Lord said, you're going to have a baby, she'd probably jump up and down and say, hallelujah. She's kind of like Buck and Julia, you know, the cheaper by the dozen. But they both laughed. But it says that Abraham believed God. He believed God. He believed that a promise that God had given to him that God would make of his seed a great nation and that all the nations of the world would be blessed through him. He believed God's promise that he would have a son. And God gave him righteousness. God declared him righteous. God called him righteous for that. That's why we call him, that's why Paul refers to him, the Bible refers to him in the New Testament as the father of faith, faithful Abraham, who believed God, who is the example of those who come to God by faith and then God imputes to them righteousness, salvation that comes from faith. Sarah had a moment of doubt and she told Abraham, hey, you know what? I'm pretty near 100. This ain't going to happen. Here's Hagar, one of my slave gals, you know, the household lady here who works out you just take her for a concubine and maybe God will give you a child through her. God did. Son's name was Ishmael. About 20 years after Ishmael was born, something pretty amazing happened. 12 years. Isaac, Ishmael was about 13 when all of a sudden uh, God's promise was fulfilled and they had Isaac. 20 years later, God once again reassured him that it was his son Isaac, not his son Ishmael, who was the son of promise. All those passages of Scripture, Genesis 15, 1 through 7, chapter 17, verses 15 through 19, 18, 9 through 15, those passages where God assured Abraham that it would be that seed, his promised seed, not Ishmael. And you know, unfortunately, when we look at the different religions around the world today, if you consider Islam, the Muslims believe that the promised seed of Abraham is not Isaac, but Ishmael. 
that all of the promises of God, the, the uh, covenant of the land, and all of those things went to the Muslims, went to the uh, descendants of Ishmael, not to the descendants of Isaac. The devil has deceived Muslims into believing that Isaac is not the promised son. The word of God states clearly, not Ishmael, but Isaac. Isaac is the promised seed through whom the Savior of the world would come and has come for sure and indeed. In Genesis chapter 22, God asks Abraham to do something that in our mind is unacceptable, unbelievable, reprehensible. God wants Abraham to take this son and offer him up as a sacrifice before the Lord. I don't know about you, but if somebody asked me to offer up my son, I don't think I'd be so happy about that, nor willing. But Abraham called, is called a friend of God, and he is a man of faith, the father of faith. This is truly a trial, a test, a challenge to Abraham's faith. How many of you would be challenged by that? If God says to you, hey, I want you to offer up your son. Hey, which one? No, I don't think so. I think it'd be a trial, a struggle for all of us. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 7 tells us that the trial of your faith, being more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, the trial of our faith. I don't know about you guys, how many of you have ever faced a trial in your life? How many of you have ever been faced with a difficult situation, a uh, terminal illness or cancer, or something? You know, many, many families, many, many, many fathers have lost their sons. My grandmother lost one of her four boys in World War II. My dad's brother was killed. Many families have suffered the loss of children. It is a trial of our faith, trying to put together the concept that God is love, God cares, but yet these things happen. I have a dear friend whose son at a young age was diagnosed with severe diabetes. That father's faith almost shipwrecked. Why would God do that? To my son. A friend of mine, their daughter was born without an esophagus. The mother was complaining to God, why me? Why me? Why her? Her husband graciously responded, why not me? You ever think to ask yourself that one? When you're going through a rough time, why me? I remember when I was a kid and had an accident with a lawnmower. <laughs> 16 years old. Wasn't even saved. And I remember sitting on the lawn in front of the picture window at our house there where we grew up on Little Pine Lake. And I remember holding my foot and looking up at the heavens and saying, why, God? Well, he could have given about a hundred good reasons why. <laughs> but it's all in God's plan. We don't understand it sometimes, and it's very, very hard for us to grasp it. Genesis 22, let's read. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And that word tempt means test. It's not attempting to sin or to be disobedient to God, but it's that proving ground. Abraham, and Abraham said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he saddled his ass, he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he claved the wood for the burnt offering, and he rose up, and he went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. 
And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and, the, and he laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and he said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And so they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and he laid the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and he laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched forth his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out unto him out of heaven. And he said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withhold thy son, thine only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. And Abraham went, and he took the ram, and he offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it, is, it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of the heavens the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, hast not withholden thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. God spoke to Abraham, verse 2, Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. Trivia question, most of you guys should know that because you've heard me say this before. Where is the first time in the entire Bible that the word love appears? Right here, Genesis 22, verse 2. You would have thought that God who is love would have introduced love way before chapter 2 or chapter 22. This is the first time that the word love appears and it appears in the relationship between a father and his son. Love. God's love is manifested in this story because this is more than just the story of Abraham and Isaac. This is the story about God the Father. Who loved his creation so much that he gives his only son, his only begotten son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. You know, Abraham, as we read this passage of scripture, we see that he didn't just believe God. Abraham also obeyed God. It wasn't just a matter that he believed that day that God had promised to give him a seed and that believing God caused God to impute to him or give to his account his righteousness, God's righteousness imputed to him. But his faith was also action. And this trial of his faith, this proving of his faith, shows the obedience of faith. Obedient faith. The faith of obedience for Abraham. There's four things that we want to look at just briefly this morning concerning his faith and that faith that had feet, that faith that acted. Act of faith is not just sitting in a pew and saying, I believe, but there's action that's associated with faith. If you really believe God, there's fruit that's going to come along eventually that shows that faith. Do you remember what James said? You say you have faith, but have no works. What good is that? I'll tell you I have faith and I'll prove that I have faith by the things that I do, by how I live. Do you love God? It's easy to say that, isn't it? It's easy to say I love God. Oh, I love the Lord. And we sing about it all the time. Oh, how I love Jesus. And I trust you do. I hope you do. I want to love him more and more. We all do. 
But Jesus said, why say to me that you love me and don't do the things that I ask you to do? So there is that association of doing that's connected with faith. Not that we're saved by doing anything other than the faith. But the faith has fruit in that which we do. Abraham is a classic example of that obedience of faith. First of all, when we look at his obedience, it was an unhesitating obedience. How many of you have ever had your dad say to you uh, that he wanted you to do something? Hey, you want to pick up your dirty clothes, put them in the hamper over there? Sure, dad. I don't mean tomorrow. <laughs> now, why would my dad have to say that to my brother Don? I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe he was just a little slow on the draw. Sometimes when we know what God wants us to do, we're a little slow in getting the job done. We're not always faithful in getting right to it. Sometimes we tend to procrastinate. I remember as a child, dad telling us to cut the lawn and it better be cut before he got home. I heard somebody say the other, morning, the other day that he thanked the Lord for the last minute. I said, for the last minute? He said, yeah, if it wasn't for the last minute, nothing would ever get done. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd wait to the last minute to go cut the lawn. Abraham's faith didn't hesitate. His obedience was without hesitation. Verse 3 says that he rose up early in the morning. God had told him what he wanted him to do. The next morning early he got up and he set things in order. He got things done. He got the donkey, he got the wood, he got the kid, he got the helpers, he got everything that he needed. He took the fire in his hand, and he had the knife, and they got ready, and they left early in the day. He got right after it. That's a good lesson for a lot of us fathers. We need to be punctual, we need to be faithful, we need to get on the job, we need to get things done. When the Lord asks us to do something, we should not procrastinate. When I was in Bible school, just as a young man, 18 years old, hadn't been saved very long, just a couple of months in fact, one of the classes that we had was called evangelism. And we had to witness to people. How many people like walking up to a stranger on the sidewalk and start talking to them about Jesus Christ? It can be a little intimidating. Well, I was scared to death. But I remember one day coming home, I worked, we had Bible school in the morning, worked in the afternoon, I worked for a little appliance store there down out a couple blocks from downtown where the Bible school was at. Got done with work, 5 o'clock. I'm walking back to the Bible school, and there's a man about a mm, few feet in front of me, not quite, maybe half a block, not quite even half a block. And he's in front of me walking. And all of a sudden, I get this thought in my head, hey, Steve, go and tell that man about Jesus. I said, what are you, crazy? This is Jackson. You don't just walk up to some stranger and tap him on the back. And so the Lord said again, Steve, you need to go talk to this guy by the Lord. Well, by then he was a block and a half away. My feet felt like lead and I was walking slower and slower and he was getting further and further away. Well, to make a long story not quite as long, I had put it off and put it off until the guy was a pretty good distance away, a couple blocks. But I felt so convicted. He was just about ready to cross Michigan Avenue. And I ran, literally. <laughs> I had to run to catch up to him. Ran and caught him just before he started to cross Michigan Avenue. And I, excuse me, sir, I said, can I talk to you for a moment? And here was this tall African-American man, very gracious. I told him all about Jesus and what he had done for me. And then I asked him if he knew the Lord, and he said he didn't know the Lord, but he'd like to. And right there that day, that man got saved. And it wasn't because of me, but it was because of God, God's faithfulness. 
But if I had to put it off and not caught that guy and he would stepped out into Michigan Avenue and had gotten killed, that his blood would have been on my hands. So many times we wait, we wait, we wait, we wait out people who aren't saved. I'm going to get saved someday, someday. And then it's too late. Abraham's faith was also a complete obedience. It was complete. It wasn't just without hesitation, but it was complete obedience. Sometimes you only do half the job. Didn't I tell you to mow the yard? I did. You didn't mow the backyard. Oh, forgot about the back. <laughs> Abraham's faith was complete. It was obedience that was fulfilled. He did exactly as God told him to do. He went exactly to the spot that God told him to do. He took everything that God had wanted him to take. He went to the very spot, went to the mountains of Moriah, to the spot where God had told him to go, Moriah, in the hills of Mount Moriah. Moriah means chosen of Jehovah. That's what the word Moriah means. God chose the place where Abraham was to offer up his son Isaac. He chose the spot. That's the very spot that God says today he has chosen forever to put his name, Jerusalem. That was the spot that God had chosen before he ever even created this physical earth. And it was that spot that God said, I have chosen this place to put my name forever and forever. That's where the temple was built, Solomon's temple. Just outside of that temple, just outside of the city gates, that's where Jesus Christ himself was crucified on that hillside called Golgotha. Abraham's obedience, his faith of his obedient act of faith was also unquestionable. How many dads have ever told, how many guys, how, we'll include moms in this because moms have just as big a job, if not bigger, uh, have asked your child to do something and they said the famous three-letter word, why? You ever get that? Stop doing that. Why? Because it's bothering me, that's why. I'm the boss, that's why. I want you to help mom with the dishes. Why? That's woman's work. I really didn't say that. <laughs> Why? I saw a movie years ago, a Bible movie. It was about the Bible. I don't remember the name of the film, but it wasn't a good film. It was a terrible film. But in this film, it depicts Abraham. It shows Abraham the night that God had told him that he was to offer up as a burnt offering his son, his only begotten son, his son whom he loved, Isaac. And in this film, Abraham went nuts. He went berserk. And it showed him running through the wilderness, screaming at God. Oh, God, why? Oh, God, no. And he's running through the woods, and he's crashing on the ground, and he's bawling, and he's weeping, and he's begging. Please, God, no. Did Abraham do that? What did he do? He got right up early in the morning and took care of business. He wasn't whining and crying and complaining and begging God and asking why. He did not ask why. His faith, his obedience was unquestionable. He didn't ask God. He didn't challenge. God says to you, I want you to do something. Why? Or I can't. Or maybe tomorrow. The world doesn't comprehend faith in a holy God. As a matter of fact, the world thinks that you're foolish for believing in a God. Ted Turner once said that Christianity was a crutch for weak-minded people. That's what Ted Turner believed. And that's what the world believes today. Listen, our unswerving faith in God brings us a victory over this world. Amen. Unquestionable faith. They're headed out. They're on their way to the mountain. His son Isaac's trolling along with them, you know. Hey, a day with Dad. This is going to be going camping. Three-day camping trip. Woohoo! Oh, hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Abraham responds, yes, son. <laughs> what is it? I thought we were going to get to this eventually. Hey, Dad. I know we're going up to this spot on the mountain here to worship God. And you know something? I see the wood 
I see the wood here for the sacrifice, for the burnt offering, verse 7 there, and I, and I see the fire for the sacrifice, and no doubt he probably saw the big butcher knife, and he says to his father, he says to Abraham, hey, where's the lamb? I see the wood, I see the fire, everything for a burnt sacrifice, but I don't know where the lamb's going to come from. My son, Abraham responded, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. God will provide himself a lamb. God Almighty, God the Father, provided the lamb in the person of Jesus Christ. Abraham is, is a picture. This really happened. It's reality. But it's also a teaching lesson that God has orchestrated. God put it together to demonstrate to us that sacrificial love of a father. The love that God has for us. Such faith. Abraham believed God. He believed God's promise. And all of the families of the earth through him are blessed. Romans chapter 4, verses 17 through 22. You need to jot that down. It talks about this faith of Abraham. It talks about the faith of Abraham who staggered not at the promises of God, but believed that God was faithful and that God would bring to pass the promise that he gave. Hebrews 11 uh, 17 through 19, in fact, give us a little clearer understanding of Abraham's faith. In Hebrews 11, it says that Abraham literally sacrificed his son upon the altar. In his heart, Abraham had killed his son. Abraham had already done it. The day that he saddled that mule, that donkey, and got the stuff together and gathered his son three days prior... In Abraham's heart, according to the book of Hebrews, this man Abraham believed that God would raise Isaac up from the dead. That's how much he believed God. God said, you're going to have a son. And that promised son, Isaac, will be the one through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. It'll be through this seed, Isaac's seed. So God says, now I want you to take him out and kill him. Hmm, must be that God's going to raise him back to life again. Otherwise, how is God ever going to fulfill his promise, which I know and am persuaded and am convinced that God keeps his word? Are you convinced this morning that God keeps his word? What if he asks you to sacrifice your son? What if he asks you to sacrifice your family or your job or your livelihood to follow him? Would you believe him that much? Would you believe God enough to where you could say, I know that my God is faithful who will supply all of my need. Are you willing to believe that? Abraham did. Abraham believed that that day that he left, he was going to kill his son. He'd killed him in his heart already. God is going to raise him up. That picture on the third day, there he is with his son. Raised his hand, took the knife. And God said, hey, wait a minute, stop the train. Abraham. And he heard the noise, he turned around, and there, behold, the ram caught in the thicket, caught by his horn. We mentioned that last week because it had to be a perfect sacrifice without blemish, without scars, without cuts or anything else. It had to be perfect. Once again, the picture of that perfect lamb that was offered up for our sacrifice as our sacrifice, our Passover lamb. It was the picture of Abraham taking the firewood once they got to the hills of Moriah and he laid it upon his son's back just as God laid that cross upon Jesus' back and how Jesus bore that wood for you and I to that place there in Moriah where God took his son, his only begotten son, and he offered him up there as that perfect sacrifice for our sin so that you and I could be called the sons of God. Lastly, Abraham's faith, his obedience. We see the blessedness of obedience. 17 and 18 there. 
that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And I love that passage right there. You ever think about that? Who's our enemies today? Death, hell, and Satan. What was it that Jesus said in Matthew 16? I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Listen, he stormed the gates of hell. He knocked them down. He went into the Sheol itself and three days later he kicked the gates wide open again and he took captivity with him and he led them all to heaven. His seed, Abraham's seed, Jesus Christ, possessed the gates of death and hell today. Just as God had promised. The blessedness of obedience. God gave us his son. And he demonstrates to us what the love of a father really is about. Sacrifice. A sacrificial love that gives one's own self. For truly it was God who gave himself for us that day. Do we as fathers read the Bible? Do we read the Bible to our children, to our grandchildren? Do we have that faith of Abraham where we love our kids, that we love God first, that we love our kids and that we're willing to give to be that example? God teaches us as a father discipline, respect, honor, self-control, all of those things are the things that God the Father teaches us as men in how we should be. Respect. Respect for life. Respect for family. Respect for women. Respect for our children. For one another. Jesus, pictured in that person of Isaac, went together in fellowship with his Father to the cross. For Jesus said, nobody takes my life but I lay it down of myself. He willingly died for you and for me. Would you trust him today? Would you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin? Would you receive him today as scripture says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're not saved, would today be that day that you get saved? This day, Father's Day, you can honor God in heaven by allowing him to be your father. Father in heaven today, when we think of the example of Abraham, the obedience of his faith, may we learn from that. May we learn from these examples and may we truly have a greater love and understanding of the love that you have for us. That great sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, the great sacrifice that you were willing to give to lay down your life so that we could have life, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could know what it is to enter into that relationship that you alone had with the Father, that relationship you had with him before the foundations of the world were ever laid, that relationship with God the Father that you desire for us to enter into and to share with you. Lord, if there's anybody here today that's not saved, convict them of the truth. Your word is true. Convict them of their sin, of their need. Convict them of this love that you have for them, that you're willing to go to that place that you have chosen, Moriah, and die for them so they might know you and know life and experience love. If you're here, simply bow your head, confess your sin, and ask him to save you, and he will, just as he said. Father, thank you for Father's Day. May you, above all fathers, be honored and glorified in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.